This is episode 63 of the Fitness and Post podcast. To access the show notes for this episode, please visit fitnessandpost.com slash 63. This episode is sponsored by Cinemodi. Cinemodi produces high-quality, royalty-free, and post-friendly second-unit stock and visual effects footage for filmmakers. You can find their second-unit collection at cinemodi.com. That's C-I-N-E-M-O-T-I dot com. And as a listener of the Fitness and Post podcast, we're offering you an exclusive 15% off discount code that's good for any order. Just enter FIP15 during checkout. Again, that's FIP15 for 15% off any order. This episode is sponsored by EditStock.com. EditStock provides high-quality, uncut film footage for those who want to learn or practice the art of video editing. This cool service offers raw footage from a variety of genres, including action, comedy, sports, and documentary, so you can pick the same kinds of projects you're looking to get hired for. EditStock offers professional feedback on your work and even allows you to use your cuts for your demo reel. Multi-user educational licenses are also available. Visit editstock.com today to download a free sample scene and use the code FITNESS to save 10% on your order. My name is Zach Arnold, and I'm the creator of Fitness and Post. You may know me as Empire Editor on Twitter. I've spent the last 10 years working long hours in a dark room and battled numerous health problems because of my less than ideal work environment. And that's what led me to building Fitness and Post. Whether you work in film and television post-production like me, or you're a designer, programmer, or anyone working a sedentary job all day, we bring you the practical tips, tools, and resources to bring health and wellness back into your life. You spend all day fixing in a post, now it's time for some Fitness and Post. Hello and welcome to the Fitness and Post podcast, where it is my mission to help you optimize the most powerful operating system that you have, yourself. Today's episode is the first of 2016, and I can't imagine a stronger way to start the new year off right than with one of the top fitness and wellness experts on the planet, Ben Greenfield. Ben is an ex-bodybuilder, Ironman triathlete, Spartan racer, high-performance coach, speaker, and author of the New York Times bestseller, Beyond Training, Mastering Endurance, Health, and Life. In 2008, Ben was voted the NSCA's Personal Trainer of the Year, and in 2013 was named by Greatest as one of the top 100 most influential people in health and fitness. Two years ago, when I began my deep dive into the world of movement science, nutrition, and biohacking, Ben Greenfield was where my journey began. And in the last two years, his site bengreenfieldfitness.com has essentially become my WebMD. I was lucky enough to meet Ben at a Spartan race last year, and shortly after, he was a guest on episode 29 of the podcast. We talked a lot about the science of nutrition and why the standard American diet is such a mess. But today's conversation is all about the dangers of sitting, why just standing isn't the answer, and more importantly and surprisingly how even exercise can't reverse the negative effects of sitting all day. I was so inspired by this conversation with Ben that I ended up writing an in-depth blog post as a follow-up to this episode that's all about the dangers of sitting, especially in an industry such as ours where six to eight hours is frankly considered a half day. If you'd like to check out the blog that I wrote, I'll have a link to it in the show notes for this episode. But before we jump into the interview, I would like to announce that I am in the final stages of building my very first online course. As many of you may know, I've been working on this course for months now, and the beta version is almost ready. This will be a 30-day online learning course that will show you step-by-step -step how to sit less, focus more, and become so active at work that you'll never feel guilty for skipping a day at the gym again. It will show you how to properly set your goals so you actually stick with them, how to reverse engineer your bad habits into good ones, how to modify your work environment to be more active throughout the day, how to hack your seated workstation so you can stand, and how to make the pain-free transition to a standing workstation if you choose to do so. And if that isn't enough, it will also contain a library of videos created in conjunction with certified yoga instructors and chiropractors that will help you stay active, reduce stress, increase mobility, as well as alleviate chronic pain in common places like your neck, shoulders, and lower back. You asked for it, and soon I will be delivering. 
I will not be publicly advertising enrollment when the beta course opens. I will only be sending a private invitation via the Fitness and Post mailing list. So if you're interested in becoming a beta member, all you have to do is download the bonus cheat sheet that I created to accompany this episode, which contains 10 ways that you can be more active at work. To download your cheat sheet and get yourself on the mailing list, visit fitnessandpost.com 63 download. And now, without further ado, my conversation with Ben Greenfield. So I'm here today with Ben Greenfield, who is actually a returning guest on the show. And for those that are not familiar with Ben Greenfield, you need to become familiar with him. I basically refer to Ben Greenfield as my web MD, basically. So anytime I have an issue or something that I want to learn about health or fitness, or somebody in the fitness and post community comes to me and says, I have a question about X, Y, Z, what do you suggest? I don't go to Google. I don't go to web MD. I go to bengreenfieldfitness.com. So it is a tremendous pleasure to have you here today, Ben. Well, I just have two things to say. First of all, I'm I'm honored to be able to come back for an encore. That means I didn't F up too many things last time. Also, you just set me up for getting sued by uh, referring to me as WebMD, but I forgive you. We'll, <laughs> I do, we'll, I do, we'll edit that I, part uh, out then. I don't want no, to get you sued. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm joking, dude. A lot of times, like, I'll, I'll say something. I, I actually got an interesting uh, iTunes review the other week. Somebody was upset that someone had called in a a question about like a heart issue they're having during exercise. And I suggested that they go to their doc to get a stress EKG to rule out something like ventricular tachycardia, like like a really high heartbeat during exercise. And this guy leaves an iTunes review. He's like, yeah, Ben diagnosed the medical condition of VTAC and was practicing medicine on his podcast. I'm like, oh my, no, not, not really. That's, that's not what I do. I'm not a doctor. I have no aspirations to be, I don't fancy myself as a physician. I just try and hook people up with, with good advice, but I do not diagnose, treat, any medical condition. I just did a really crappy job with the medical disclaimer. Yeah, but. no, I, tr- I trust me. I I can understand the position that you're in, and that's what I love so much about your site is that you're not constrained to specific guidelines or restrictions or recommendations. Like you can just find the best information in the field, cutting edge information. You can share it with people, and you have you've been voted one of the top personal trainers in the country. You run, I think, what do you have like forty three podcasts now? I can't keep track anymore. You do a lot of podcasts. You have your site. You try travel all over the world and speak at conferences. So you definitely know your stuff, but you're not technically certified as a physician, which frankly, which is I why think I actually is better for you. About, about giving yourself a coffee enema. Yeah, exactly. Not not a whole lot of doctors can say that they write blog posts like that. So so there you go. Uh, but the, the expertise that I really want to tap into today is your knowledge of how to use the body to its fullest potential if you do not have the time to go out and exercise or train. Like I know that you deal with a lot of triathletes and Ironmen and people that are really into physical fitness and they'll take three hours in the morning and go for a bike ride before they start their day. But my audience is a little bit different and that we are just trying to find a way to stop sitting all day long for 14 hours a day, stressed out with crazy deadlines in front of a computer in a dark room. Yeah. And I think the biggest psychological barrier is people saying, well, I can't get out and run three or four times a week or I can't go to the gym, therefore I'm going to do nothing. But they don't realize there's so much that can be done throughout the day where if you do it right, you can almost get home and be like, well, I guess I could exercise, but it, it's kind of just a bonus at this point because I've been so active throughout the day. And I've heard you in the past talk about this concept of greasing the groove, which is an idea that comes from the book, The Naked Warrior by Pavel Satsulin, who's known as the Russian that brought the kettlebells to the West, but certainly is one of the the top strength trainers and knows a lot more than just kettlebells. But let's talk a little bit about before we go into the actual activities and things that can be done, I want people to really understand from a scientific level why being sedentary and sitting chronically for 10 to 14 hours per day can be so detrimental to your body because I still don't think that it's it's setting in yet and I want people to understand what's going on in the body physiologically. Sure, yeah. Well, sitting is not bad for you. Sitting is not bad for you. Sitting is a position that we see lots of animals in nature doing. Um, you know, you, you'll see your dog kind of lounging around the house. You'll see 
you know, monkeys sit, you'll see, um, you'll see, you know, octopuses sit on the bottom of the ocean. Like, like being, being in a sitting position is not really the issue. The issue is being in any one given position without moving for long periods of time. Now, most of the research, of course, has been done on sitting simply because that is, in our modern era, the chosen adopted formal position that you'd be expected to be in at work. But I could create just as many issues and similar issues uh, that, that I'm about to get into by standing all day or by lunging all day or by, you know, this would be uncomfortable, like being in a squat position all day, right? Like, like you, can, you can create issues by being in any one given position. So I don't want people to think that sitting is bad to get throw your chair. It's just that you need to view your chair as just one of the positions that you can be in during the day. There, there's a few things. First of all, uh, in the research that they've been doing primarily since about 2010 on sitting, they found some interesting things. Uh, first of all, it increases your risk of diabetes. It increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. It increases your risk of colon cancer. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term metabolic syndrome, but it's kind of a cluster of issues. High triglycerides, um, high heart rate, high blood pressure, basically all of the things that decrease the lifespan of your ticker. Like all of those increase when you sit and specifically when you sit for approximately eight hours a day. Okay. So we're, we're not talking about, you know, to sitting down to have a meal automatically causing you to, to be lumped into a high risk factor for cardiovascular disease or, you know, creating a risk for a quadruple bypass. What we're talking about is sitting all day long. Now, the, the interesting thing is that they found, uh, it was a study in 2012, they found that these same risk factors will persist even if you work out at the beginning or the end of the day which is kind of a shocker. This means that you could be like one of those like crazy crossfitters or, you know, you, you finish your day with a swim, bike and run. And ultimately, yeah, those workouts at the beginning or the end of the day will help make you fit, but you still have a lot of cardiovascular risk factors if you spent the entire day sitting without getting up and moving around or without spending the day getting into a variety of different positions. And actually, there was one study, this was so the 2014 or late 2013, that found that some of these factors persist even for sitting any longer than two hours for any given period of time, right? So even just having your butt planted in a chair for two hours at a time, which is relevant not just to people at an office, but people sitting on an airplane, people sitting in a car, et cetera. So that's one issue is kind of like the metabolic issue. And a lot of those metabolic issues are because when you sit, your metabolism decreases, your uh, fat burning activity decreases, and you uh, you also see an overall drop in, it's just basically your metabolic rate goes down, drop in fat burning, increase in triglycerides, and it's, it's what you would expect from someone who is, who is being inactive. Now, when you stand, interestingly, you see an upregulation in that lipase, that fat burning enzyme, upregulation of metabolism, upregulation in body temperature, and a lot of these metabolic issues tend to go away. So now, now that's not to say that, that standing all day is good for you. Like I mentioned earlier, there are some issues with that. I know people who stand all day who get foot pain, ankle pain, you know, Las Vegas, waitress style varicose veins up and down their legs because they're on their feet all day. Like you, you do need to make sure that, that you don't just stand all day as a way to mitigate the metabolic damage. But ultimately, metabolism is one thing. Low back is another. Tons of people have low back pain. I was hanging with one of my buddies just last week, and we were at uh, like a like a class together. This was a four day class that we were at, and he kept complaining to me about his low back pain. And if you looked at me during that class, we were in we were in classroom for six six seven hours a day. I was lunging, kneeling, sitting, standing, stretching, leaning against the wall, doing air squats every time I went to the bathroom, coming back in, stretching, bringing my arms over my head, and he was sitting in the chair the whole time. And he's complaining of low back pain. And the reason for that is, and the reason for his chronic low back pain is because he has not yet adopted the mindset that he needs to get up out of the chair to decrease pressure on the low back. 
to decompress the spine. There's more forces on your spine when you're sitting than when you're running. I mean, it's, it's crazy the amount of force that the simple act of sitting in a modern chair creates on the spine. So if you have low back pain, neck pain, uh, thoracic like mid back pain, it creates a lot of issues from a bio, now we're not talking biochemistry, we're talking biomechanics, right? So that's that's the next issue with sitting. And then there's also, there's, there's, a, there's a biomechanist named uh, Katie Bowman who has some really interesting theories and a little bit of research she highlights in her book, which is called... Uh, You're talking about Move Your DNA. I'm a big fan of Katie Bowman's work. Yeah, she talks about blood flow and specifically the fact that when you hold a joint in one position for an extended period of time, well, what travels through joints, uh, vessels, blood vessels, nerves, etc. So you essentially are kinking specific areas of your body and that potentially, if you just stand up and start to move around really quickly after having those areas of your body kinked for a long period of time, you could create what's called like a turbine blood flow and actually increase your risk for say having a heart attack, right? Like if you go for a run after a day of eight hours of sitting, you've got a bunch of kinked blood vessels in, for example, your hip flexors, which are shortened all day long. So there's, there's kind of an interesting vascular effect as well. So those are some of the main issues with uh, sitting for long periods of time or really being in any one given position for long periods of time during the day. There's, there's the metabolic factors that increase your risk for heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, and all of these have been shown to be uh, more prevalent in people who sit for long periods of time during the day. Again, no matter how much they exercise, there are the biomechanical factors uh, with joints, low back being really the biggest one for people who sit. And then there's also the blood vessel issues. Yeah, and the, there's a lot of stuff in there that I want to hit based on a lot of conversations I have with people in my industry. Um, the first of which is I'm so glad that you said, well, there's nothing wrong with sitting. Because I think that now that all of a sudden all the headlines are sitting is the new smoking and sitting will kill you, people are thinking, oh my God, I should be deathly afraid of my chair. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's not the chair that's the problem. It's that you're there in one position all day long, which brings me to the next thing that's so prevalent right now is people saying to me, hey, I'm I'm standing now, so I'm healthier and I'm all good. And I will respond to them on Facebook or email and say, no, it's not about whether you're sitting all day or standing all day. The key is movement. You have to be moving, changing your position. Like I'm a squirrel in my office. I have a really small office. It's like 10 by 12. Most of it is equipment. But at any given time, I will be on the treadmill in front of my desk. I will be walking in circles. I will be foam rolling on the floor. I will be using a lacrosse ball on the wall or while I'm watching footage. I have a kettlebell. I have resistance bands. Thanks to you, I have a MOGO now. I absolutely love the MOGO so I can kind of sit and kneel but not have hip flexion and not be sitting all the way down And but it'll take some of the pressure off my lower back. So there are so many different things that can be done in your space but saying, okay, now I'm a standing editor, I'm healthy, that's not the way to go. And I actually just got somebody uh, somebody sent me a Facebook message a few days ago and I wanted to get your take on this. They said, hey, a buddy just told me that standing and working all day long over the course of a week is the equivalent of running a 10K. So I'm super healthy. So please tell me that that's wrong and tell me exactly why. Yeah, it probably is. Probably, metabolically, in terms of calorie burning, considering you can burn you know, an, an extra handful, right? Like a few dozen extra calories per hour if you're standing for eight hours a day. Let's say you're burning an extra 200, 300 calories a day, uh, seven days a week. We'd be looking at what, like uh, 20 100-ish calories, which you could easily burn running a 10K. But remember, we're not just looking at metabolism, we're also looking at biomechanics. The same people who stand all day, a lot of times do complain of some foot issues, some venous return issues, pooling of blood in the extremities, specifically the feet and the legs, sometimes some hip issues. You can still slouch when you're standing, right? Because you're in that forward shoulder position. So there are some issues with, with standing as well. It's similar to you, like right now while we're talking, I'm walking on my treadmill at a standing desk. Next to the treadmill is a foam mat. It's a foam mat called a, a Kai Bounder, and it is designed to cause the tiny foot and core and hip muscles to contract and balance as you're standing. And then, of course, there's, there's carpet next to that that I can stand on as well. I can also lie down, kneel, lunge, or sit cross-legged on that mat or on the floor, which I'll also do. I have a pull-up bar just outside the door of the office that I can go hang from to decompress 
and to also lengthen the shoulders and to pull them back when I'm hunched over typing during the day in any of those positions. I also, up in the garage, because I work from a home office, I have an inversion table. An inversion table is something that you can have. When, when I had an office, it's the same inversion table I had when I used to have an office downtown. I literally had this inversion table in the closet in the office downtown, and I would pull it out of the closet, unfold it, and hang at certain points during the day, right, for just like two or three minutes to decompress the spine, get a little blood flow to the head, keep the blood from pooling in the legs. Upstairs at the kitchen table, I have one of these things called a Veridesk. And it's designed for a laptop. And it's just this little contraption that you place on anything, kitchen counter, kitchen table, wherever. And it you push a button, it unfolds, and it turns anything into a standing workstation. And upstairs, I also have one of these little mats, these, these, these Kybounder mats. And then I also have uh, something called a fluid stance, which is like a balance board that I can stand on to kind of balance and wobble as I'm working. And then I also have, you know, I'll work from the couch sometimes, I'll lay down on the floor by the fireplace on my stomach and work. So, you know, for me, I do most of my work from a laptop. And so I've chosen to do that, even though I'm more efficient on a desktop, a laptop allows me to be more versatile in my movement patterns. So it's just kind of a, a health choice. Um, those are those are some of the, the positions that I'll vary throughout the day, but ultimately your, your friend probably is right. From a metabolic standpoint, you can burn a, a heck of a lot of calories from standing, or of course, even more so walking during the day. But the trick is to you know alternate positions, again, not to kick that horse to death. Sure, okay, well, what I wanna get into next, um, you would brought up the, the idea of the pull-up bar, and that kind of led me to the, the thought of greasing the groove, because that was the first thing that I thought of that I could do to get started greasing the groove. So now that we've kind of highlighted some of the basic things that are happening with the body and why just sitting all day or just standing all day or really being sedentary is something that people really need to be concerned about, especially in this industry, because when I read the headlines, it's sitting for six to eight hours a day, and I just kind of laugh. I'm like, that's a half day for people that do what I do. Like a normal day for us is 12 hours and a hard day is 14 to 16 hours. And all of that is spent sitting in one position. So. Right. Just- and, and if I could just interrupt you real quick, I, I don't want to offend people, but a big part of it is just pure laziness. That is a big part of it. A lot of people will, will argue that, oh, it's social norms. It's that my boss expects me to. It's that like I, I look a little weird if I stand. But the, the problem in most cases is that it simply takes energy to shift positions, okay, in the same way that it takes energy to go to the gym after a day of work, in the same way that it takes energy to make yourself a salad at the cafeteria rather than grabbing Doritos and having the person make you a sandwich and hand that to you in the same way that it takes self-control and lack of laziness to get out of bed in the morning 10 minutes early to do some stretching and some deep breathing and maybe some journaling. Like these are lifestyle choices. And so in many cases, people sit just because they freaking need to get into the mindset of not being lazy. The cool thing is once you start moving, you get huge boosts in cerebral blood flow. Like anytime you, you find yourself like sleepy, brain fog, et cetera, you freaking switch positions and there's a there's just like this little boost, this little burst of creativeness and blood flow that happens all throughout the day as you shift positions. But ultimately, like a big, big thing to realize here is that part of it, part of the question that your listeners need to be asking themselves when they are sitting is, am I sitting because everyone else is sitting and I think it's a social norm or am I sitting because this is just freaking easy. And what you'll find is that that in many cases, uh, it's, it's just you being lazy. I mean, you do have to be honest with yourself sometimes. I'm not going to correct you because I, I agree with a lot of that. However, there are circumstances in our specific industry where I do know and have talked to people that have said, listen, I really, really want a standing workstation and I want to move around more. But in my job, I have a fixed workstation where it's like you know a large workstation with three or four monitors and heavy equipment. And they have people seated behind them all day long where they actually have clients, directors producers that are on the couch behind them, that to me is an environment where there, there is a reason to say, I want to do it, but I'm not really sure how. And that, that's where greasing the groove comes in. Yeah, that's where greasing the groove comes in. And that, that's basically the airplane analogy, right? It's like, okay, you're on an airplane, picture this, tightly packed airplane, not a lot of space, you know, the, the average like domestic American flight where you cannot 
stand the whole time on the airplane. You just can't. You're in people's way. You, you have a specific place that you need to be. And it's like sitting is one of the only things that you can do for the majority of the time, right? For like 80% of the time, you just kind of have to sit. And that's the situation where you just set the clock, right? It's like every 55 minutes for five minutes, you're going to get up, you're going to go to the back of the airplane, you're going to do, and this is like a thing I do on the international flights, right? And I won't get up and I won't stand up unless I have a plan for when I stand up. So what I have is like, I go to the back, I do 10 squats, I do 10 shoulder shrugs, I do 10 calf raises, I do 10 circles of the neck in each direction, and then I do 10 torso twists in each direction. That takes me three, four minutes or so. I walk back, I sit down, right? So I like have a, I have a little plan. I don't just stand up for the sake of standing up. Now, in the same way, we get to this concept that, you, that you've highlighted and, and explained pretty well, this greasing the groove concept. It's the idea that throughout the day, you take brief periods of time to do specific movements. Now, the idea of greasing the groove originally, to be honest with you, was a term coined to uh, describe the process of making the body better at a specific movement by repeating that specific movement multiple times throughout the day. Like you want to get really good at pull-ups, you don't do a workout that consists of 10 sets of five pull-ups. You instead take 10 breaks throughout the day to do five pull-ups to make your body very, very efficient at that movement without necessarily exhausting the body. But the, the term itself, um, whether due to you know, my, my own slightly incorrect use of it or you know, just, just people's adoption of it or expansion of it, has come to also mean this concept of getting up at certain periods of time throughout the day and having little rules that you set for yourself. And again, for me, it's all about having a plan. It's all about having rules. So what are some sample rules? For example, every time you go to the bathroom, you do 20 squats. Every time you've been sitting for an hour, you stand up and you do 50 jumping jacks. After every meal, you move for 10 to 15 minutes. By the end of the day, you try to amass 100 burpees with zero rules. You could do three here, four there, 10 there, etc. Every time you go up or down in a building, you take the stairs. These are, these are just all examples. Um, there's even the greasing the groove rules I'll follow in my car, okay? So when I'm traveling in my car, I have something called a power lung, which is a resisted breath training device that you breathe in and out of that works your abs, works your inspiratory and expiratory muscles, your rib cage, your breath hold capacity, your blood flow, and then I also have a grip, a hand grip strengthener, right? Like it's called a Captain's of Crush, this little grip trainer that you squeeze. So every time that I'm driving on the highway and I pass a mile marker, I'll do five the hand grip strengtheners on one side, then five hand grip strengtheners on the other side. And then the next mile marker, I'll do five power breaths. And then the next mile marker, I'll do 10 Kegel squeeze, squeezes, right? Like squeezing your, as, as though you're gonna stop the flow of urine to train the, the deep core muscles. And then that last mile marker, I'll do 10 seated rows, meaning I pull myself into the steering wheel and then push myself away. Pull myself in, push myself away. And I can drive for like 100 miles doing that and I'll have a fantastic workout without even stopping at, you know, like a gas station, do squats and jumping jacks and stuff, right? Like if I just wanna make good time, I'll be sitting, but I'm like working the whole time, having a fantastic workout, listen to an audio book, you know, and, and just grooving. Now you can, of course, do the same thing at the office using a lot of the rules that I've just described to finish up the day. You look back and you're like, wow, well, I used the bathroom four times. So I got in 40 air squats. I stood up every hour during those eight hours. I did 50 jumping jacks. So I got in 400 jumping jacks. I took the stairs every time, and by the end of the day, I'd amassed, you know, whatever, five minutes of stair climbing, and then I got a good 30 minutes of movement in because breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I tried to move and do something for 10 to 15 minutes. And so like you mentioned at the beginning of, of our podcast, by the end of the day, you get to decide whether or not you want to go to the gym. It's not a requirement because you've been sitting on your ass for the past eight hours. Yeah, and that's really the biggest issue that people have is they just wake up in the morning or the, even the night before, they say, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up earlier, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to go for a run, or I'm going to go to the gym, and then they wake up and they feel horrible, and they hit the snooze button 10 times, and then they go to work, and they're at work saying, all right, well, I skipped my workout, and I 
didn't go this morning. I just, I have to go tonight. I have to go tonight. And then they end up working until eight or nine o'clock and they get home and they just are exhausted. They barely can stand in front of the refrigerator, open the door and grab something to eat, much less put on their workout clothes and go to the gym. And then you just repeat that cycle over and over and over. And I lived that life for years. And what I realized is that doing one small thing during the day is better than dreaming about doing five workouts a week that you're never going to do. And it really is, it's a psychological barrier you have to get over. I mean, they just had a study last month that showed that micro workouts. So I, I, I forget the actual length of time and the mode that they were using, but it was something like a 30 minute treadmill jog compared to three 10 minute workouts, like three 10 minute jogs. And the three 10 minutes beat out the 30 minutes just because they were spread throughout the day. You get that metabolic effect, that blood flow effect. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's funny because I did the, a couple of weeks ago, I did the world's toughest mutter, which is where you're just like racing for 24 hours. My training for that was every hour while I was working, I would run a mile and do 10 pull-ups. So I'm working for 52 minutes, run a mile, do 10 pull-ups, keep working. Right. Cause that, cause you're just training yourself to kind of like be moving all day. But, you know, so you can take this concept and you can even use it to like train for athletic events if you don't have time to work out at the end of the day or if you just want to sprinkle your workout throughout the day because you know that when you finish the day, you're going to be too tired to like go to the gym for an hour. So you'd rather do just a bunch of these little micro movements. Yeah, and that's something that I'm doing right now. I'm training for the Spartan Sprint that's going to be just north of Los Angeles in a couple of weeks. And I'm working 14 to 16 hours a day right now. So it's not like I'm going to the gym. It's not like I'm doing three-hour hikes for three or four days a week. I've got two young kids, so it's just not going to happen. But like you said, I'm not saying to myself, well, I have to be doing these intense, you know, these HIIT training workouts every single day. I just need to keep moving because I need to train the body to just constantly be in motion. So I think I probably sit I don't know, maybe a grand total of an hour to two hours a day total. And most of that is near the end of the day because I I think that you and I have this in common and maybe this has changed for you, but I have a very hard time writing when I'm standing up. I I sit when I eat and I sit if I'm writing a blog post or, you know, writing something where I'm intensely being creative. I just, I can't do it standing up. I don't know why, Um, but pretty much everything else, I'm either on the treadmill, standing, on the MoGo, doing something that's, you know, on the go or moving, but that just trains my body to move and I'll try to get in a a P90X workout early in the morning if I can. But if I don't, I'm not thinking, oh, well, there goes my one chance to be active for the day. I'm actually being more active throughout the day. And I'm glad that you had brought up the thing about the 30 minute workout versus the three 10 minute workouts because I was going to ask about that because you had mentioned much, much earlier in the show that if you do a 60 minute or 120 minute workout, if you're a triathlete and you're one of those people that gets up at 4.30 in the morning, does your bike ride, does your swim, and then you sit for 12 hours a day, if you were to take that exact same amount of time and space it out incrementally over the course of the day, not only is it the same, but you're saying it's actually better for your body. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I do the same thing with writing. So I I certainly do have creative processes. So I do some fiction writing and I have a hard time tapping into my right brain when I am standing or walking. And so I do a lot of my fiction writing, same, I follow the same rules, right? Like I typically do lying on my stomach, lying on my back or sitting or lunging, but I do technical writing, standing or walking. And, and I found that I can do a lot of the left brain stuff just fine even when I'm moving. So a couple of the uh, tools that I wanted to bring up that you didn't mention, you brought up a lot of great stuff. One of which that you didn't mention, which surprised me is, are you familiar with the topo mat? Have you heard about that? Yeah, I have, but I just already had a couple of these Kybounder mats, and so I use those. But yeah, I mean, the topo mats are good too, just like the name implies. It just provides a topography for your feet, like a bunch of different kind of like foot positions that you can be in during the day, and that works fine. I just happen to already have a couple of mats, and my wife would probably kill me if I started importing even more things to take up floor space. So yeah, the topo mat is good though. Yeah, and I'm, I'm literally standing on it right now, and it was a massive game changer for me. I just discovered it, I think it was maybe a month or two ago, and I just recently had a podcast with the, the designers of it to really understand the evolution of where it came from, why it does what it does, but it really just promotes a tremendous amount of movement. And I had uh, another editor in my office, I was working from home, and he wanted to use my office just to be able to export something. And he's like, what is that mat? I was standing there, and I just I just started to move more, and I didn't even think about it. And that 
that's really what it's all about is just promoting that idea of more movement. Another tool that I wanted to bring up, I know that you mentioned that you try to get up every 55 minutes to an hour. And one thing that I hear from my audience so often, this was me for years too, is you say, but I, I can't I can't be interrupted. I'm just in the zone. I'm, I'm creative and I'm flowing and I'm in the zone and I just don't want to be interrupted. And I'll spend hours where I don't drink water, I don't eat anything. And then I just come out of it and I've created this great work. And I used to be that way, but what you don't realize is you're now just putting the pedal to the metal on your car for hours on end and burning out the car. And now you're not going to be able to even reach your destination because you're going to overheat and you're going to be exhausted. So what I've trained myself to do is get up every 50 minutes to an hour. And I have a couple of different apps that do that. One of which is a, a Pomodoro app that's called Focus Time. But the one that I really like now is an app that's on my desktop called Break Time, where it literally makes my screen go black after 50 to 55 minutes. And it can be annoying, but I also find that when I do it consistently throughout the day, by 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, I still have the same amount of focus and energy as opposed to burning myself out for those three hours of intense focus and then being useless for the other nine hours of the day. Sure. The question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to create great work, be fat, and die when you're 60 by creating great work quickly? Or are you willing to create great work at a slightly slower pace, have a great body, and live until you're 80? And I don't even think it's so much about working at a slower pace, because I work and clip along at a very, very fast pace. But it's because I'm pacing myself throughout the day, and I'm constantly moving around and going outside and taking walks and taking bathroom breaks. And I never work for more than an hour at a time. And even if I'm with somebody in the room, a director or producer, I'm like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, and they can tell immediately when they walk in my room and they're like, oh, you've got a treadmill and you're wearing Vibrams on your feet. Like they can tell that I'm, I do things a little bit differently, but I say, listen, you know, every hour or so, I just want to let you know that, you know, I want to get up or move around. Like I just want to stay active so we can keep going all day. And never once have they said, you know what, I'd really prefer if you just sat. Like they join in, they love it. Yeah, you're one of those guys. I'm one. Yeah, and you know who I have to thank for that? He's on the other end of this microphone. So thank you, mister. (laughs) All right, so along the lines of greasing the groove, first one caveat that I want to tell people is if you're going to be doing the squats in the bathroom, do it before or after, not during. So just I just want to put that caveat out there. But let's say that somebody is coming at this that doesn't really have much of a basis for fitness, and they're listening to this and saying, well, I'm not going to do 50 jumping jacks, and I'm not going to do 100 burpees because I'm 75 pounds overweight. And when I go up a flight of stairs, I am out of breath and out of energy. So let's really step back because the I think that the I'm going to start implementing a lot of the rules that you have because I'm not as regimented as that, but I want to be. So I love those rules and they work for me. But if I'm somebody that just looks at that and says, even that's overwhelming, where's a really good place for somebody to start literally from square one? Besides getting into a variety of different positions during the day, which is automatically, if you are overweight and unfit, going to be kind of hard for you, you're going to find that just the mere act of sitting down, standing up, moving, lunging, kneeling, etc., just like get your heart rate up. You may even break a sweat you know, by the end of the day doing all those things. Low impact activities work really well. So for example, you can get one of these pieces of elastic tubing with handles on either end of it and your break instead of doing you know, burpees can be to take that elastic band, stand on it and do five shoulder raises to the side, five shoulder raises to the front and then like 10 air squats. Or your activity can literally just be every time you gotta make a phone call, you stand up and you pace around your office knee push-ups if you have like a soft floor just like getting down on your knees and doing like knee-based push-ups again super duper low impact yeah you'll eventually probably progress to a regular push-up and and yeah maybe even a burpee but ultimately it's just starting with smaller movements the cool thing you have going for you though if you are overweight is that pretty much anything you do is going to be harder even breathing like over overweight folks sometimes are told, oh, you're overweight because you have a low metabolic rate. I used to run a metabolic laboratory. The folks who came in who had the very highest metabolic rates were all overweight because your body has to work so hard to move and breathe when it has extra insulation and extra fat. So you kind of are, it's like you're wearing a weighted vest, right? And that actually is, is a great little rabbit hole to delve into. Ankle weights, hand weights, little weighted vest that you can put underneath your clothes if you are walking around and moving. Like I do a lot of blood work Thursdays. I load up my computer with everybody's blood work. I put it up up on my standing desk. I put on a 20-pound weighted vest. 
I hop on the treadmill and I walk with a weighted vest on for like four hours while I'm doing those consults. It's like going on a hike. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things you can do. It doesn't have to be burpee land. Yeah, and I literally have a weighted vest sitting underneath my coffee table next to my desk at the office too. And people look at me and be like, why do you have a bulletproof vest in your office? I'm like, it's not yeah. a bulletproof vest, it's a weighted vest. But if I am wearing and they're coming and they're like, uh, what are you doing? I'm like, just trying to stay active, you know? But the, there is that that cultural idea that all of this is just unacceptable. Like, and I hear that all the time where people will email me or reach me on Facebook and say, listen, I just, it's not culturally acceptable in my office to be getting up and moving or taking breaks, but it's okay for me to go take a smoke break. It kind of goes back to your idea of, well, some of it is just using it as an excuse to be lazy. Um, But this one thing I'm really trying to do is really reshape the culture. What I'm trying to show people is that if they take the initiative to start moving a little bit and they start to feel the increased energy the increased creativity and the increased focus, then when somebody says, you know what, I'd really prefer if you didn't do that, then they have the energy to fight back. Because mm-hmm. I, I had somebody recently, an assistant editor had emailed me and they on their whiteboard were writing down uh, like exercises they wanted to do throughout the day, like squats, push-ups, lunges, whatever it was. And their boss actually came by and said, well, I'd really prefer if, if you didn't write those things on the board and do those things on company time and on company property, you really should be working. So let's talk a little bit now about not just what can happen if you're sedentary all day long or what you can do to stay active. But let's talk about how implementing these things are actually going to give you better brain function and make you more creative and more focused throughout the day and what's actually happening physiologically because that to me is the big win for people. Yeah, in addition to the blood flow that I already described, the main thing is that when you're moving and especially when you're moving aerobically, versus doing like strength training and bench pressing, you create a lot of what's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And that's also abbreviated as BDNF. That's something that acts in your brain to increase the quality of neuronal connections and also neuronal growth, as well as memory, both short-term and long-term memory. And so when you move, you increase not only blood flow to the brain, but also a very important factor that crosses into the brain and allows you to boost your cognitive performance. Returning to what I mentioned earlier about how you feel this little burst of creativity a lot of times as you move to a different position, or you feel this little wakefulness boost as you stand or as you stretch. And a big, big reason for that is both the blood flow and the BDNF. With the reason that it acts more in the brain with aerobic activity, primarily being that when you do strength training, it tends to get produced, but it stays the muscular level, whereas when you do aerobic activity, it travels throughout the body. It doesn't stay at the muscular level. So that's that's the main thing that you feel. Yeah, and I think that that's the easy win that people get out of this because, I mean, you work with people all day, day in and day out that are trying to reshape their lives, trying to get in better shape, trying to lose weight. And in the fitness and diet game, it's, it's a long game. You can't just start eating really well for three days or go out and do a five-mile run and then look in the mirror three days later and say, wow, I look and feel so much better. Like, it, it doesn't work that way. And you have to be patient and just continually put in the time and over time your body will change your life will change but when it comes to the the greasing the groove idea and doing these activities these are easy wins that if you are sitting for 12 to 14 hours a day you're going to notice this stuff immediately you're not going to have a thinner waistline and you're not going to lose 50 pounds but you're going to feel better almost immediately and that's where the easy wins start to stack into more so i really want to emphasize to people that you have to get past that psychological barrier of saying well if I can't exercise five days a week, I'm not going to do it at all. Because if you do it for 10 minutes a day, that's 10 minutes more than you were doing before you started doing something. Yeah, exactly. One more area that I wanted to veer off to before um, I lose you, just because you're such a wealth and knowledge of information, is you talk a lot about unconventional ways to be able to burn extra fat, which will then, of course, raise your metabolism, give you more energy, more creativity, and more focus. Because to me, my program is not about looking the best and having the thin waistline and having the 
the beach body. It's about how can I optimize my brain and my operating system so I can be the best creatively at my job. That's really what it's all about. Um, one thing that I have adopted is the the cold thermogenesis, and you've totally gotten me hooked on doing freezing cold showers in the morning and at night. And I thought you were nuts. I'm just I, I remember watching the video of you taking the cold shower. I'm like, this guy's crazy. And I started doing it, and it is a life changer. So can you just walk? And this the reason I want to bring this up. It's because in a way, this is almost another form of simple free activity or a way that you can change your daily routine to get a ton of benefit out of it without really having to do anything different or take extra time. So can you just talk a little bit about that and then any other ideas you want to throw out there that are those really cool unconventional ways to just burn a little bit of fat and boost your metabolism? Sure. And and, and let's focus specifically on, you, you kind of delved into the brain a little bit and you brought up a, a great example being cold showers. And I also am a big fan of keeping the room at a slightly cooler temperature for the same reason. A few other things that that I kind of like as far as as little known ways to improve brain performance or to uh, to increase the metabolism. I'll give you I'll give you two more. The first is there are these uh, these sounds that you can play in your ear called binaural beats. I use an app called Sleepstream, which I really like. It's not just for sleep, even though it works really well for sleep, but you can also set it on creativity, motivation, focus, de-stress, et cetera. You put one earbud in one ear, one earbud in the other ear, and it plays sound frequencies into your ear that bring you into the specific brainwave patterns associated with that frequency. And so it's really good, you know, if you're if you're writing technically or you're writing creatively or you're sleeping or you want to power nap, that's a really, really cool one. So I like that, the, the use of binaural beats and sounds. And then the other one, we talked a little bit about, about quite a few of these. I, I guess one more that I'd recommend is uh, when you look at sunlight, it produces a lot of light from what's called the blue light wave spectrum. And while your listeners may be familiar with like iPad insomnia and not looking at screens at night because it can keep you awake at night, you can also tweak that and you can use that to your advantage, right? So like this morning, I was using blue light. So I was not only in my office and I have these light bulbs in my office called awake and alert bulbs, which turn out more blue light. But then I also have these glasses that I wear and and I also have an in-ear device. The glasses are called retimer glasses. The in-ear device is called a human charger, but both produce light that simulates sunlight, one to your ears, one to your eyes. And it's really, really cool for increasing your wakefulness, or in my case, because I just got back from back east, I waited to expose my body to any light. So I got up early in the morning. So I got up at like 5 a.m. because I'm still on, on Eastern time, but I did most of my activity. I actually put on blue light blocking glasses, kept them on until 7 a.m., Right, and did did all my work, my stretching, everything in the dark, and then I put on these glasses and the in ear device, and just blasted myself with simulated sunlight to bring my body back into the time zone that I'm in, and to give myself a boost of wakefulness. You know, eventually by about 1 p.m. today, I'll, I'll settle down for a nap. But I'm also a big fan of lights. So those are the two I'd recommend: is uh, binaural beats and light. Yeah, and I love the idea that you brought up light. And for anybody that's listening and wondering what sunlight is, I'll make sure and put a link to the show notes and I'll show a picture of what the sun is as well because many people in my industry don't see that too often. <laughs> um, but it, this isn't actually an area that I wanted to, to go into, but it just occurred to me that this is a huge area of focus that is another one of those, you can almost in a way grease the groove as far as light because in our industry, we never see daylight ever. We get in our cars early in the morning, we drive to work, we're in a dark room, we can't have windows because we have monitors and they're calibrated for proper color and proper picture. So the vast majority of people in this industry just don't see light. And I don't think people understand how much not having exposure to regular daylight will actually affect their metabolism, affect their creative focus, their cognitive function. And that's one of those things that you really have to try and get out there and do every day where I make sure that I expose myself to either blue light or sunlight in the afternoon because not only is that going to help my 
my focus, but it's also going to make sure that my sleep cycle is within a regular rhythm. So can you just talk a little bit about light hacking and how that will work as far as your sleep schedules, your circadian rhythms, your focus, and also you know, just how it can help you switch your circadian rhythms if you're traveling? Because a lot of people in my industry travel all over the world for conferences. I have a article that I've written about that over at bengreenfieldfitness.com. It is, uh, if, if you link to it in the show notes, Zach, it is an article about hacking your body with blue light and red light. And it's, it's the most recent one. I believe it's the same article in which I talk about that human charger device. Mm -hmm. Um, and I discuss in, in that particular article, there are a bunch of links to older articles that I've done on the same topic. So yeah, check out, check out that article. If you just do a search for like Ben Greenfield, what is the human charger? I think was the title of that article. It'll pull up uh, reams of info because, frankly, I don't I don't even have time to get into all that. It's just too long of an explanation. Yeah, no problem at all. And I definitely want to make sure that you can get back to what you're doing. But I am immensely, immensely appreciative for you coming on the show today and helping my audience understand how they can be more active and focused and creative without having to go to the gym because that is the holy grail of our industry. So I very, very much appreciate it. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, if folks have questions, uh, you can uh, send them over my way. I'm happy to clarify anything. And um, I'm honored to be back. Love what you're doing, Zach. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I love what you're doing as well. And I will continue to send people to the WebMD of uh, Ben Greenfield <laughs> Fitness. Uh, disclaimer, he is not a physician or a doctor or a trained professional. Or what, Well, yeah, actually, you are a trained professional, but you, you get it. Yeah, that. I'm not a so. complete slacker, but yeah. I'm not, <laughs> yeah. There you cool. go. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate All it. All right. Thanks for having me on, man. Okay. All Bye-bye. right. Later. Thank you for listening to episode 63 of the Fitness and Post podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to access any of the resources discussed, visit our show notes at fitnessandpost.com slash 63. As a reminder, I have created a bonus cheat sheet to accompany this episode that contains 10 ways that you can be more active at work starting today. To download your cheat sheet, visit fitnessandpost.com slash 63 download. This will also get you on the Fitness and Post mailing list so you can be the first to know when the enrollment opens for the beta version of my first course. This episode is sponsored by Cinemodi. Cinemodi produces high quality, royalty free, and post friendly second unit stock and visual effects footage for filmmakers. Let's say that you have a restaurant scene, but you just don't have enough activity in the shot. Need some additional extras? Cinemodi has the footage for that. Or maybe you need to add some three dimensional depth to a flat shot. Want to add a defocus tree branch in the foreground? Cinemodi has that too. Their flagship second unit post-friendly footage features live action visual effects content that can easily and affordably add production value and polish to your next project. You can find their second unit collection at cinemodi.com. That's C-I-N-E-M-O-T-I dot com. And as a listener of the Fitness and Post podcast, we're offering you an exclusive 15% off discount code that's good for any order. Just enter FIP15 during checkout. Again, that's FIP15 for 15% off any order. This episode is sponsored by EditStock.com. EditStock provides high quality, uncut film footage for those who want to learn or practice the art of video editing. This cool service offers raw footage from a variety of genres, including action, comedy, sports, and documentary, so you can pick the same kinds of projects you're looking to get hired for. You know the frustration of needing a reel to get a job and then needing a job to get a reel? EditStock solves this old chicken and egg problem by allowing you to use your cuts for your demo reel. EditStock is ideal for assistant editors trying to move up, editors transitioning to a new style or genre, and people who are brand new to editing. EditStock can even give you professional feedback on your work. Best of all, every time you buy raw footage on EditStock, 30% of the purchase goes to the filmmaker who created it. So you can help these indie directors earn back their budgets. Multi-user educational licenses are also available. Visit editstock.com to download a free sample scene and use the code FITNESS to save 10% on your order. Thank you for listening. Be well.